Welcome everybody to our uh, next uh, uh, tutorial uh, dedicated to using different machine learning tools on our whole system. Uh, I am uh, uh, very happy to introduce today Joshua Yao Yulin, who is going to be presenting about the PyTorch. PyTorch is a very, very popular uh, framework for developing uh, deep learning models. And so uh, Joshua has been using it for quite a while and he is very proficient with it. So he is uh, well positioned to give us a very good uh, introductory tutorial to this. Just a couple of notes. Um, uh, we posted and will post again a link to the GitHub with his tutorials. I'm posting it again now. And um, uh, so feel free to go and grab that GitHub and follow the tutorial yourself. Um, uh, as Joshua presents it, on, you, can, you can follow it on, on Google Collab, or you can also uh, uh, get these tutorials uh, files cloned to Hall. And on whole, there is a reservation, UIUCI underscore 11, that you can use for this tutorial. And so with that, Joshua, please. All right, thanks for my, very much for the introduction. And uh, thanks for having me as well. I'm uh, super excited to share about what I learned uh, over the past year about PyTorch and excited to give a broad introduction about it. Um, so, I mean, uh, again, my name is Joshua Yolin. Um, so before starting, jump into, uh, so uh, I want to welcome everyone to coming to this uh, uh, health training session on, on PyTorch. Um, so before I really jump into the details, since I think it's uh, my first time giving this kind of tutorial. Um, so I, I didn't, um, so I thought about maybe I could introduce myself and talk about something I've been working on and why I'm excited about this. Um, so I'm actually uh, a physics PhD student uh, right here at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. I'm currently uh, just writing my thesis and hope to graduate and move on next year. Um, so my research mostly focuses on um, machine learning application uh, and astrophysics. I think just like Assad, who gave a really nice tutorial last time. Um, so in my own uh, research domain, I mainly work on uh, like things like dark matter or supermassive black holes. And recently I've got interested in neuroscience and obviously machine learning has been playing a, a big part of my research over the past year. And uh, before I joined uh, UIUC, I actually did my undergrad and master degree in, in Taiwan where I grew up. Um, so beyond that, um, I'm also like uh, have a few like machine learning intern experience, which I'll be happy to share uh, after, after this tutorial if someone's interested. So I've been spending uh, the past few months at the Simons Foundation in New York and Google Research, mostly working on a machine learning related project. And um, so I've used PyTorch mostly uh, for most of my deep learning projects. So today I'm very uh, happy to, to talk about uh, why I think PyTorch is really good. Um, so for today's agenda, I actually thought about like uh, at first, like I, I want to give you an overview of PyTorch and deep learning. And since I actually don't know what, like, what's the background of people, so I assume like there might be some people who just start like get into machine learning. So I'm going to use a few minutes to talk about really basic stuff about what is machine learning and what is deep learning, and then move on to some of the PyTorch basics, like how PyTorch operates and how how do it look like, and how how can you make it to be a neural network. And we're actually going to train a convolutional neural network to classify MNIST data in real time uh, using a notebook I provided. And also I thought about like, uh, maybe we can also play with some kind of a generative model. In this case, a variational autoencoder to generate some of the handwritten digits. And I'm going to have a question and answer sessions uh, at the later part uh, of this presentation, but feel free to interrupt me if there's uh, any questions. And uh, if you haven't uh, saw a link, and this is a link to the tutorial, uh, which you can have access to the slides and the notebook and almost everything right there. Cool. Um, so to give you a broad like idea, especially for someone who just like entered this field, like when we talk about deep learning, it's actually a subfield of a bigger area called artificial intelligence, which is basically trying to use like mostly it's kind of like you try to use computer to solve everything, um, not ne necessarily about the learning stuff, but you just try to solve it. For example, like uh, IBM built a computer called Deep Blue, who, which can play chess, but it was pretty much hard coded at the back end. 
So it's like broad artificial intelligence. And machine learning has to do with the task of learning, which like you give some data to your algorithm and actually learns from the data through some learning algorithm and makes its own decision afterwards. And deep learning is just a subfield of, of machine learning, which has been quite popular, especially in the, the task for computer vision or natural language processing in the past like 10 years, like since uh, mostly, uh, I think uh, the, the bombs really started from the ImageNet challenge in, uh, in 2012. Uh, so what do we call deep learning right here is the learning algorithm that have to do with something we call the artificial neural networks. So which uh, I'm going to tell you how you can use PyTorch to build such a things. And these are some like really basic uh, broad overview about what's the classical machine learning. So it can be supervised that you can do classifications and regressions. And there's something called unsupervised, which you don't actually have the label of the data, but you can actually do it with uh, all the things. But uh, I'm not going to jump into that much of detail today, but just to give um, uh, people a really broad overview. Um, so PyTorch has many to do with uh, deep learning and inside these uh, machine learning uh, domain. And PyTorch, uh, so, so the first question is like, what is PyTorch? So PyTorch is an open source uh, machine learning library. So if you click the link on the slides, it, it could directly take you to the web page of PyTorch and you can see a lot of like amazing things being done right there. And it's actually developed by a uh, Facebook uh, AI research lab. So um, I found it really, really useful. And there's a lot of like uh, support online and also like there's a uh, big communities that are using PyTorch. So for example, like if you check out some of the uh, New York Soviet paper, a lot of people are actually using PyTorch uh, for their uh, open source, uh, uh, open source like uh, basically source code using PyTorch. And the good thing about the PyTorch is that it actually leveraged the power of GPUs. So like we are in the era of deep learning and GPUs is actually quite important uh, for uh, these uh, like major authentications in your network. So uh, PyTorch is really good at that. And it's also like uh, have a really good uh, automatic computational of gradients and also a dynamic graph within which I'll jump into in, in, in the future. And one thing I particularly like about PyTorch is that it's really easy to uh, test and develop new ideas. Um, so for example, like I'm working in, in astrophysics, so I actually like to do a lot of like small experiments with uh, machine learning. So actually I think PyTorch are quite flexible that I could test my own idea in like just a few minutes, like after coding, I can start thinking about new things. So. Um, I really appreciate how like uh, flexible PyTorch is. And the next question is like, uh, why PyTorch? So, um, so as you may know, there are many existing like deep learning open source library uh, around the market. And I think last uh, week, I think I saw it gave her a very nice tutorial about TensorFlow. And um, so TensorFlow and uh, which has been uh, developed mainly by uh, Google. And, uh, um, and there's also like library like Keras, which I personally also find uh, really, really uh, easy to operate. Um, and I, I, I like uh, both of them a lot, but um, PyTorch is my favorite. And recently there's uh, another new thing called Jax. So Jax is also like a lot of like tools that have been uh, mainly developed by a lot of people at Google Brain and uh, DeepMind and lots of like community as well. Um, if you haven't, uh, so this is something kind of new to the market, but I also personally like it a lot and actually it looks pretty similar to PyTorch. So if you um, are interested, I encourage you to check it out. And um, of course, PyTorch is also like uh, available on the market. And I think PyTorch is really good in my personal point of view, because I feel like it's sort of give you a flexibility to let you do your own thing. But at the same time, it's like really easy to uh, write in terms of codes and operate. And if you want to change something, I think I found PyTorch is a really, um, really the best uh, model 
uh, library uh, on the market at the moment. So um, there are many good things about PyTorch. So the first thing to begin with is like it's Pythonic, like so like it's so as you can see, like there are many deep learning libraries like TensorFlow or before that there are cafes or Fianos. Like uh, but some of them do not like really have a good mixture of Python because they were probably developed using other language at the beginning. Um, but like like sort of like you can start feeling like these are actually two different codes that are working uh, underneath. But for PyTorch, it's actually uh, embedded uh, really well. So um, like uh, I really like that part. And um, as you can see, like they have a really good GPU support. So what I mean right here by GPU support is that usually when you want to operate things on uh, GPUs, like you need to write some CUDA codes. And PyTorch allows you to basically operate things on GPU just by changing one line of code by adding things called dot CUDA, like basically after some lines of uh, PyTorch code, which I'll just show you in a second in the tutorial, which I found really, really helpful. And you can do a lot of amazing things on the GPUs right here on, on Hell as well. Um, so like, it's also really good at uh, automatic differentiations. And um, there are also like lots of libraries that are building uh, around or within PyTorch that you can be easily implemented right here. And last but not least, I think it's like, when people start learning Python, I think NumPy is basically uh, what people first start to learn how to operate numbers uh, within Python. And PyTorch uh, is extremely similar to um, NumPy, so which I personally found really helpful for the transition from using NumPy to PyTorch. Right. So uh, the next thing um, about why PyTorch is great is that um, basically, uh, so when you usually try to build a neural network, you're actually having some computational graph you're trying to set up. And you can actually do all the things in NumPy, to be honest. Uh, but NumPy usually operates on CPUs, but not GPUs. So as you can see, you can build out a pretty good computational graph like correspond to uh, the diagram on the left. And in TensorFlow 1.0, like uh, usually you need to operate with something called tf.session, which I personally found like um, um, usually you need to have spend more time on uh, writing the codes. And if you want to change something afterwards, uh, usually uh, you need to uh, be, be more experienced or like spend more time on, on dealing with it. Um, but I think there's a lot of improvement in TensorFlow 2.0 and so on and so forth. But I think PyTorch was sort of like became really popular when TensorFlow 1.0 uh, started to have this problem when uh, things are growing too big. It's like you really want to have a library that can operate really fast and you want to change things and do experiment with it. So I think PyTorch is really great. And as you can see, to build the computational graph on the left with PyTorch, you only need like a few lines of code and it's pretty simple and beautifully done right here. And so then the next thing about PyTorch is that there's basically something, the basic block of PyTorch, which is called the PyTorch tensor. So uh, as you can see, like in deep learning, there are lots of things that you need to do, basically tensor uh, multiplications or calculations. And so like PyTorch has its own thing called PyTorch tensor, which usually we call it tensor. And it's very similar to NumPy array. So as you can see, like right there, we have X and Y, and we do some mathematical operations by combining these two um, to build a function. And you can actually build it up really easy using these uh, um, PyTorch tensor. And uh, they are really good for uh, building neural networks, which I'm going to show you in a tutorial in a few seconds. All right, so um, after talking so many good stuff about PyTorch, I think about maybe we can jump into some of the coding session to uh, basically start like playing with PyTorch and see what it's all about. All right, I'm going to move to PyTorch basics. So I'm sharing my collabs right now. So right here, we are at these, uh, uh, PyTorch Basic, which basically uh, operates on Google Colab. 
Um, so if you want to like install like uh, PyTorch on your own workstation or laptop, I think there are uh, installation um, uh, instruction right here, but you can also check out pytorch.org. There's a lot of great tutorials about how to set things up. And um, if you want to have access to this uh, collab notebook, I think you can actually click the uh, link uh, within the notebook. There's a there's a button called uh, "Open it up in collab," and you can start doing the same thing as me. Or I can like actually do a demo right here for you just uh, to see how it works. So let's get it started. So the first thing about PyTorch is that we uh, usually when we start with Python, uh, if you are something new to Python, usually when you want to use some library, usually you need to first start with import at the at the beginning, and basically it's just operate like import something and it's automatically loading right here, which is super handy. And um, right now I think we are using PyTorch. I think the latest PyTorch is PyTorch 1.9, and it operates with uh, CUDA 10.2. So uh, I mean, sometimes there will be some issues with your uh, CUDA version. So just to keep in mind that uh, if something's not working, it might be just go back and check uh, whether it's the version problems. Um, so the first thing we're going to start with is to see how these uh, tensor operates. So um, basically, the simple thing we can start is like to start with uh, one-dimensional data. Like you have a list right here called data. It's a floating uh, a bunch of floating number one point one two and three, and you can basically uh, create a. This is a list in Python uh, data structure. And the thing that you actually build a tensor, right? A PyTorch tensor is that you can just use something directly called uh, torch.tensor and operate it on data. Then you can get the exact PyTorch tensor that you want. So we're just super convenient in my point of view that you can actually operate things uh, from um, Python list to PyTorch tensor. So you can actually uh, create like different levels of 1D, 2D, and 3D data and just to see how they actually operates right here. So as you can see, like uh, when you print out this tensor, usually your uh, notebook or like the, the PyTorch itself will tell, let you know that this is a PyTorch tensor instead of like a Python list or NumPy array by specifying this is a tensor. So you can see the tensor right there. And um, then pretty much everything is similar to like the NumPy or uh, list architecture. As you can see, like uh, if you have a two-dimensional thing, there are just two like additional brackets right here. Three-dimensional thing, there are just things right there, which is pretty much similar, it's the same to uh, all of the Python data structure that you have. And the next step, what we're going to do is to uh, create an empty um, uh, PyTorch tensor. So you can actually create an empty PyTorch tensor and just render the create like lots of really tiny values right here. I think it's because of the precision uh, issues, but you can use this to create basically a empty PyTorch tensor. And one obvious thing is that when you use NumPy, you want usually a lot of like scientific stuff, you want to generate random number. And um, in PyTorch, you can do well, exactly the same thing by using torch.random, and then you can generate a, a, basically a tensor of random numbers, which is super convenient. Right. And the other similar things, just like uh, what you might already seen uh, NumPy, is that you can actually uh, generate a bunch of zeros and ones right here. So as you can see right here, uh, I mean, this is pretty similar to how you generate like zero matrices in uh, NumPy. So right here, just use torch.zeros and it's automatically generates a bunch of like these zero matrices. And you can actually change the data type into different things, uh, which I'll talk about more detail when training your network. But at, at this moment, I think I'll just uh, leave it right here. And for generating matrix made of one, you just change zeros to one, and which is uh, super handy. 
right here. Right, so after having these really basic operations, um, we can um, basically create a tensor based on uh, some existing tensor. So like, for example, like you already have a tensor shape, like these uh, two times three matrices that are made of one. And you want to generate a random matrix that have exactly the same shape as this one. But you don't want to specify this number again for some whatever reasons, um, which is actually quite common in uh, scientific computing. And what you can actually do is to use something called the rand, rand and like to create this uh, random matrices by specifying like you want this random matrix to have this shape like this original one. So which is super convenient as well. So there are many, many good things about PyTorch that as you can think of, they're very likely a function already uh, building right there for you, waiting for you to use. All right. And right here, we are going to jump into the size of the tensor. So right here. So usually when we um, talk about shape of NumPy array, like NumPy array, usually I think in PyTorch, people usually call it, usually you call the function called size. So basically if you have some data and you forgot like what's the shape of it, or you want to change the dimension, um, usually you do something with uh, by calling tensor.size. Um, for example, like right here, uh, we have uh, three different levels of tensors. And when you call their size, you could directly tell uh, the, the dimensions. And, and not only the dimension, but also the, the length of uh, in each dimension right here, which is uh, really, really helpful. Right. Um, so after having those uh, basic block, next things like we sort of wanted to do is to operate with these tensors. So we sort of like have the basic block of it. Now we want to do something on, on, on top of it. So the most basic thing is addition. Like you have two vectors or you have two tensors. The simplest things you want to do is to add an up and see how it goes. So in um, PyTorch, I think it's actually kind of flexible that you can do addition in multiple different ways. For example, like you can do like z equals to x plus y, which is like basically like whatever most simple Python operations you can have. And you can actually see that it actually works out pretty well right here. And you can use this uh, PyTorch building method by say, saying, uh, calling PyTorch.add and calling these two vectors. And you can actually also create an empty, uh, empty tensor and then add these two, two up. And these three will basically give you the same results. Um, sometimes if you're really, um, cautious about computational time, I think they, they might they might operate slightly different at the back end, but that's uh, usually something when 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 you really need it, then you, you, you could look into the documentation and see how they actually operate. But I think for general purpose, I think all of these methods are super convenient uh, for you to use. And I think in some sense, it's actually pretty uh, user friendly, to be honest. And Beyond like calling X and Y, you can actually also do in place addition if you are thinking about saving some of the computational memories. For example, like uh, you have a really big matrices and you once you update some of them, you don't really need to uh, keep the keep track of the original one. So you can do some in place operation right here, which is also super convenient. Yeah. Right and um after addition what you what people really want to do with these tensor uh especially in the era of deep learning is uh we want to do with uh matrix multiplications so when we talk about matrix multiplications there are actually uh various different ways so i'm going to show like how each way is going to operate uh how do you operate them uh 
using PyTorch right here. Um, so right here, I have two tensor or two vector, and I want to do an element-wise multiplication, which means like I want to see one times four because they are all at the zero of index of the original vector. And I want to see two times five, three times six, yada yada yada. You get the idea. And I, what I what I do is like very easy. Like I just like x times y equals to z equals to x times y, and you print z out. It's actually uh, element wide multiplications that we are looking for. Um, but for, as I said, for um, multiplications in matrix, there are actually uh, lots of different cases. For example, like if you want to do an inner product of these two factors, so uh, what you want to do is that you want the summation of like the multiplication of each element-wise um, product, and you want to see a scalar afterwards. So what you want to do is to call it a torch matrix multiplication and operates on X and Y. Then what you can see is that you have 4 plus 10 plus 18, which equal to 32 right here. So this is uh, also pretty um, handy. And I think in a lot of like deep learning operation, we are actually using a lot of like these uh, inner product things um, afterwards when like, yeah, which I will jump into detail in later chapter. And there's something called the outer product. So, I mean, uh, if you remember like the uh, first, like freshman year, like math or calculus, you probably uh, remember this, like you have two vector and you can use a cross product, which operates in different way from the previous metric multiplication methods I described right here. And if you have a, a one by three or uh, matrices, usually uh, you expect if it operates on like X and Y that transpose, which means like we swap the, we swap the uh, sort of like a vector of, uh, dimension right here. Usually we'll expect to see a three by three matrices. And that is exactly the case uh, using these uh, torch dot out outer product uh, operation. So which is pretty simple. Um, so I think at this moment, um, I think we talk about how we build up a um, PyTorch basic block by calling something called torch.tensor. We learn something about how to do addition, how to do different types of modifications on top of it. Next thing uh, I'm actually going to jump ahead to talk about is to uh, how to do activation function on top of it. So um, activation function is uh, a nonlinear function which operates on uh, these uh, PyTorch tensor. And um, I haven't really explained what they are, but I think in previous tutorial, I might have learned about these activation functions. But right here, uh, I'm just going to give you a really quick demo about how to operate them with a uh, PyTorch fashion. So right here, uh, as you can see, you have a torch tensor called X. Like it's made up one, a hundred, minus a hundred. And one of the most famous or most widely used uh, activation function in deep learning is called the ReLU. So ReLU function is basically, you basically chop out everything and, and a negative and replace it by zero. And you pretty much keep all the things linear uh, when things are positive. So right here, what you can do um, if you want to have this operation is that you can import something uh, called pi, uh, torch.nn, which is an uh, abbreviation for neural networks and stuff in PyTorch. And in, in those, and, and there are lots of functions that are really useful. So you don't really need to define them by yourself. So right here, just called nn.relu. And sometimes you need to be aware of some things are capitalized, capital cases or something like that. But otherwise, it's uh, pretty uh, easy to operate. As you can see, like I operate this value on these uh, input uh, tensor, which pretty much give what I was describing. Like it, uh, oh, I think this is uh, wrong, but let me just 
ignore it. Uh, just basically pretty much chop out the uh, negative values right here. So as you can see, uh, negative 100 now become uh, become zero and pretty much keep the other things uh, remain the same. And obviously there are, are more um, activation functions than uh, value. So for example, like hypertension, uh, which you might also see in a lot of like calculus or linear algebra textbook, it's also a pretty good activation function in a lot of cases. And so what this hypertension do is that it brings really large values into something close to one or minus one if they're from the negative ends. So um, as you can see, we do the similar operation by calling hypertension on top of these uh, X matrices and basically brings a large value in, back into one, large value in negative back into minus one. And for one, basically you can see that there's some uh, intermediate values start showing up according to uh, mathematical structure of uh, hypertension right here. Great, so we learned about uh, how these uh, activation function and how you can import them uh, using torch.nn right here. So the other additional things that um, are kind of handy is that sometimes in those PyTorx tensor as NumPy array, you only want to call like specific index out of it. So you can actually uh, pretty much do basic uh, Python operation. So this doesn't only work in PyTorch, but works in a lot of Python data structure in general. So as you can see, like I want to call it a uh, column with index one, which is two and five. So what I did right here is just specify one and just automatically output whatever I want. So this is another good thing about PyTorch is that it actually uh, blended with uh, the, the idea or the operation of Python really well, so which I found really intuitive when you start doing things, um, putting things together. Right. Um, so the other thing uh, we are going through right here is to learn about how to reshape these tensors. So reshaping tensor could be quite important uh, when you try to uh, deal with neural networks. So sometimes you want to reshape things into higher dimension or lower dimension, or like you just want them to like flatten out or do whatever you want. So basically right here, uh, what you can do is to use a view function, which usually um, just flatten out the, uh, the stuff that you are doing right here. Right. And the additional thing about like these uh, uh, PyTorch things that sometimes you, for example, like if you have a 2D image, but your neural network might be thinking like it wants to take a 3D input, usually there's a extra dimension just like about the thick of your image. So usually, Python, uh, usually PyTorch is really uh, easy to operate when you want to change a dimension. Uh, what you usually call it is called like unsqueeze, so you can add extra dimension right here uh, by calling uh, uh, unsqueeze function on, on uh, and specify the index right here. And you can also like uh, change uh, the place you want to unsqueeze it. For example, if I change it to right here, then you can see that it's becoming a four for M1 which the extra dimension come in index number two, which is really helpful when you when when you first start building your network, you basically uh, want to make sure that you are fitting the right things that you're thinking about. Right. And also there's all the things that you can do by um, taking out the uh, values in those tensors. So as you remember, like most of things when you print them out, they do tell you that it's tensor. But if you want to uh, just directly get the value out, you can use a uh, something dot item and just directly output the value, which is really handy. And you can do like whatever operation in Python you want with them. So which is pretty, pretty convenient. 
And right here, uh, these are all the other really uh, simple stuff that um, we're trying to go through right here. Um, so um, above the uh, tutorial, we usually uh, operate with a, a torch tensor. But in some cases, especially for scientific computing, you might have things coming from NumPy arrays or other data sets. Uh, you want to build up a really convenient tool to like swap between these two. And this is what PyTorch are really good at. So um, for example, like if you build a PyTorch tensor, like PyTorch say uh, tensor made of one, and you want to build a NumPy array that have exactly the same information of this, what you need to call this after you call dot NumPy after a tensor and just automatically uh, made this uh, New NumPy array from Torch uh, Tensor for you, and you can do like um, and um, one interesting thing to notice is that it actually keep tracks of the original uh, tensor. So if you do some operation on the original tensor, the value of B actually changes with it. So that's something you want to be aware of if you're doing some kind of calculations within it, right? And the other really simple thing is that now we have a method to bring torch tensor back into NumPy. Then you might ask, is there a way to bring NumPy into uh, PyTorch tensor? And the answer is yes. So right here, we basically swap the what we are doing uh, above. So now you have a matrix called A. Um, so what you want to do right here is that if you have a NumPy array, if you want to swap that into PyTorch tensor, you pretty much just call torch.from NumPy and operates on A. And then that's pretty much how you get the um, PyTorch tensor from NumPy array, So which is pretty uh, cool. And just an overview about the list structure compared with like a, a torch tensor. So, if you want to swap a list uh, back into tensor, just call dot tensor. So I think the different is like you call something dot numpy or torch dot tensor. So these are pretty um, basic operations for um, PyTorch. So um, after this really uh, basic stuff, the next thing we are going to slightly move on to things that are more exciting. Like it's a uh, how do we bring all this stuff? So above, which actually operates on CPU to uh, automatically uh, operates on uh, GPU. So I uh, think in Colab, there's uh, basically a built-in GPU that you can use. Um, so right here, what you want to do is to import Torch. And there's actually a function called torch.cuda is available. So whenever you operate PyTorch on um, a machine, if you wasn't sure whether GPU is set up right there, you can always call this function and see whether uh, a CUDA or GPU is available right there. And if that's available, what we do right here is that basically uh, try to set up things um, to GPU. So usually what people do is that you can specify a device um, called CUDA, which is pretty much GPU. Um, so you can use a device equals to torch.device CUDA, and you specify whatever stuff you have right here. And if you specify them with a device equals to device, it actually directly generate these uh, new data on GPU. So they are storing in GPU memories and operates on GPUs, ready for you to do uh, a lot of operations. And you can actually uh, specify uh, just like a normal tensor and data bring it on to uh, uh, CUDA, like uh, say X2 device. And then you can do operations right here by uh, spinning out Z. And um, you can like bring back to CPU right here, like this operations. So one of the common mistake people usually make is that when remember like CPU and GPUs are operate differently. 
So sometimes you might have a mixture of things and you, when you try to operate them together, you want to make sure that they are operate at the same places. Otherwise there'll be usually some kinds, there'll be some type of errors that start showing up. So for example, like what I'm trying to show right here is that if I forget to uh, bring my X tensor into GPU, and this is very likely to give you some kind of error. So this is saying that, oh, these two shouldn't work together because one of them is already on GPU, but the other is on CPU. So based on what the operation you want to do, you can either bring them all back to CPU or just bring them uh, to GPU. So this is some of the uh, common like um, novice mistake when I first jump into PyTorch that I have. So just to give you a sense about how things operate right here. Um, so basically right here, we cover all the basic fundamental stuff about uh, PyTorch. And I was wondering whether there's any question from the audience at this moment. All right. Um, so if you're good, then let me keep uh, moving on to the autograph, which is the essence of why we use a PyTorch to build neural network. And um, I think I'm going to jump uh, quickly through this because I actually have a neural network tutorial for you to realize that what these are actually about. So um, usually when you talk about neural networks and using PyTorch, we are actually required to keep track of the gradient of the update of our matrix. Uh, through uh, usually called uh, an algorithm called wrap propagation, which is pretty much uh, standard neural network training are using, uh, like right there. So um, as you can see, like PyTorch has this building function. Like if you want to keep track of the gradient, you just set up like requires grad equals to true. Sometimes it might take, uh, I believe, more memories or more operation underneath it, but I think it's pretty much similar that. If you want to keep track of the gradient of something, then you should do it right there, um, right? So this is something that will show up in the later part of the uh, neural network training that I'm going to talk about. So right here, I'm just going to fly through this because I feel like uh, it might be better to see a real example of how this actually works. But just to give you an idea that sometimes you need to set this to true or in order to do uh, some bad propagations to to keep your neural networks updated. And in neural network, there are like uh, these uh, big Jacobian matrix um, as you, I'm not going to explain the mathematical structure of it, but basically you're trying to find the differentiate of E, uh, the first derivative of each component, uh, keep track from your original matrix. And PyTorch can easily, uh, take care of like those uh, calculating or keep track of these uh, Jacobian matrix. And these are just some uh, operations that you do right here. So I think this is pretty much the first half of the tutorial about how PyTorch actually works from a really like basic block uh, point of view. And what I would like to do right now is to bring you the really exciting things about how, how after having these knowledge, how can we build a neural network uh, with PyTorch right here? So um, what I'm going to do is to um, bring you back to a slide and give you an example about one of the classic machine learning uh, problem that people were solving using neural network. And it's actually called the uh, MNIST uh, image classification task. So like uh, there are a lot of these uh, handwritten digits. And uh, one of the challenge at early age is that uh, early days is that uh, usually like uh, you want to have an algorithm to like classify these handwritten digits. They come in different ways. People write things differently, as you can see, like for example, like sevens, even though like we can easily recognize by eyes, but these could be challenging for early stage computer vision tasks because like each seven actually looks very different uh, on the pixel, pixel spaces. So, and this has become a 
some of the early challenge for uh, that people try to use machine learning to solve. And so the idea about how this actually works is that um, when you are given an image, you are actually given the computer a bunch of like pixel values. Like for example, like threes and seven, these are like, as you can see, most of the pixels are zero because there's nothing right there. But when you look at them, there's some value on top of these uh, pixels. The question is like, can you come up with an algorithm that directly uh, recognize this is a seven and this is a three with varieties of different threes and seven and other uh, numbers right here. And it turns out that neural network um, has been one of the, I, I think it's it's the most successful, successful tool uh, in computer vision these days. So uh, one of the classic cases for new, these neural networks are called uh, convolutional neural networks, which have to do with the convolution operations uh, within neural network. So we are actually going to build one using PyTorch right here. Um, so just to give you an overview about how these neural networks actually works. So bear with me if you uh, are already quite familiar with it. So the idea is that you have some input image and they do have some pixel value. You want to do convolutional operation on top of it and you give in a lot of different, so all of these are some of the hyperparameter, which I'll explain individually later on and I also walk you through with the PyTorch code. And so what we want to do is to set up a neural network that can directly uh, train from this. And so one of the things that you uh, we want to know is that how these uh, convolution actually operates. So um, the mathematics behind it, it's convolution. Uh, if you're like uh, not familiar with it, I think there are uh, lots of like uh, uh, equation form uh, and you can, you can find uh, when you Google it. So, but just to give you an idea about what they look like right here is that if you have some input image and this is at the middle is the convolution or kernel which we're going to specify in PyTorch later on. And at the after convolution, this is your uh, intermediate product called feature maps uh, in convolutional neural network, which basically keep track of the information from input after this convolutional operation. And as you can see, usually because of the uh, convolution kernel, there is some down sample right here. So as you can see, like most of the convolutional neural network, they do have a funnel shape like the at the deeper layer, usually the size are smaller. And right, so the other things right here, which we already talked about, is the uh, activation functions that we're going to call it in uh, Py PyTorch. So these are actually quite crucial. And the reason why neural network could really work so well is these uh, activation, nonlinear activation function, which gives neural network the power to approximate almost any function if they're really big enough. And the other block that we're going to use is called max pooling, uh, which usually helps reduce the size or of, of, the, of the features that they're uh, at the intermediate step of the uh, within the neural network. So what max pooling is doing is pretty simple just as you can see right here, uh, it's basically uh, picking up these uh, four pixel images and just keep track of the maximum value within this four. So this is a pretty simple uh, operation, but uh, people found this really helpful when training neural network. And the other thing we haven't talked about is the logs function. So usually when you train a neural network, what the network is trying to optimize. So it's an optimization problem. Usually what the network is trying to optimize is these loss function. And in the case for classifications, usually uh, people use cross entropy as the most uh, simple like an elegant, um, elegant loss function for uh, cross entropy. And I'm not going to talk about the mathematical detail of it, but I want to give you an idea about like Usually when you have their labels, uh, usually for example, like zero is labeled as zero, you don't directly label in as zero, you use a one hot vector that um, have a vector size of 10 and you specify 
like the zero of index is one and the other is zero. So this is actually a real label. And you come up with some algorithm that try to output the normalized probabilities uh, of a given image, say like I, I found a zero. I think it's very likely to be a zero. And, but I also wasn't so sure whether it should be a nine or six, something like that. So you want to give another probabilities right here. And the cross entropy is trying to um, basically trying to do a matching between these two and output a value that you can try to optimize with. And it's actually going to optimize with an algorithm called bat propagation, which I'm not going to talk about today, but we're going to see how PyTorch is using this algorithm uh, with its function right there. So right now, um, what I want to show you is how to use PyTorch to build uh, such a convolutional neural networks. And let's get started. So I think in the in the notebook, you probably could uh, see this uh, PyTorch uh, MNIST classification notebook, which I'm going to use to uh, walk you through how these uh, uh, convolutional neural network works. Right, so uh, I'm going to move on to these uh, um, PyTorch MNIST classification task. So. Usually when you try to start training a convolutional neural network with PyTorch, you basically import a bunch of things. Like, um, as you can see, you import the most basic PyTorch and Torch and which have a lot of like uh, good stuff, like good function that you can call. And um, I'm not going to explain all of them in detail, but just to uh, give you an idea, like you, you need to import uh, those libraries uh, in order to uh, train your neural network properly. So, um, so you import a bunch of stuff. And right here, I do specify something is the random seed of these PyTorch. So usually in uh, scientific computing, we want our code to have reproducibilities. And usually because like we are operating things in sort of like random way. So uh, if you can keep track of your random seed, it usually helps uh, reproducibility for a lot of cases. So this is how you call the random seed with uh, PyTorch. And next thing we want to do is to check whether our GPUs are available and which is the case right here. So that's good. And when we train the neural network, usually we start with like some of the hyperparameters right here. Uh, for example, like epoch, which is like when you train a neural network, we want to feed the neural network through your training set. And the number of epoch means like how many iteration have the whole data sets been seen by this neural network. And since what I'm going to give the, this demo is actually a pretty simple case. So I'm only going to set epochs equal to one and to, to make this uh, training at real time. But usually in more challenging case, you might have to set up more epochs for and wait for your neural network to train for sometimes it could take up to hours or days. Uh, it really depends on the task. So these are some of the hyperparameters I'm setting up right there. And this is something called the batch size and learning rate, which I'm going to explain uh, slightly later on what they actually are. And right here, we are going to download our data. So in uh, PyTorch, there's already a really uh, build up tools for you to download these MNIST data sets at, as they are kind of like a classic data sets for people to jump into machine learning. So right here, we're just going to directly use its function to download the data and set the training to true for train data. This is actually kind of crucial uh, when you want to do neural network training that you want your training set to di be different from a testing set. Otherwise, you might run into a problem of overfitting or just memorizing the data instead of actually learning in for, for a real task. And the next thing, I'm not going to explain in detail, but I believe in the next hell tutorial is that uh, we are going to cover something called the data loader, 
which I think is one of the best thing in PyTorch that you can have this data loader to help you set up how you want to load the data and uh, do all kind of operation for you in this data loader. So right here, what we only specify is that we specify the batch size. What batch size mean right here is that how many images we want to feed to a neural network during a training period. So like uh, usually when you have batch size that are larger, usually they train better for generalization. But on the other hand, like you could run into memory issues when you have batch size that are too big. So it's really a hyperparameter of your choice. And right here, we also want to download the test data uh, to test how well our neural network actually operates. And as you can see, uh, when you usually try to train things right here, there is something called PyTorch variables, which are actually kind of crucial. You want to keep track, bring your tensor into variables. So like, they can uh, be fit into a trainable neural network later on. Oh, right here. So um, what I'm going to do right here is to basically try to um, download the data and try to visualize them right here. So what I'm doing right here is that I already download the data and I visualize the training data. So these are some of the handwritten digits from my training set in MNIST. And a good practice of these uh, deep learning things is that you want to make sure that your training set is different from testing sets. So the naive way is just to visualize them and see whether they're different. And if they're different, then you're good to move on to the next step. And as we can see, we visualize them right here. Um, and so we have our data set up ready. And now we want to train a convolutional neural network with the PyTorch. And so I'm going to, I'm building an exactly same neural network as what this image is showing right here, uh, step by step for you. So uh, what we want to do with PyTorch is that basically, uh, when you want to build a neural network, you, you set up a class and you specify the name for your neural network. And usually there's a, an, an dot module right here. And to set things up, uh, basically there are three different, uh, two different things. One is the initial structures like in, in, in it that you're setting up right here. The other is that how you want to forward your information from layers to layers. So in this case, we want to have a neural network that have one of the convolutional layer at the beginning and with some activations and max pulling afterwards and another series of convolution at the other layer with a gain activation function and max pulling later on. And I want to flatten out my lots of 2D patches of the information into a long vector and use uh, something called the multi-layer projection or, the, uh, or something called an undot linear to uh, combine them and feed them into uh, uh, output neurons that um, have a dimension of 10, which represents for 10 different labels for digits right here. So what I'm doing right here is that um, you can basically set up your convolution by specifying a name. And one thing about good thing about PyTorch is that you can use something called sequential to basically bring a series of operation together. So what I'm doing right here is that I'm going to set this convolutional one uh, that includes a series of 2D convolution, which I specify some of the hyperparameters right here, and I'm going to explain what they are to you right now. So in 2D convolution, usually you have an uh, input channels. So usually in MNIST data set, there's only one, it's grayscale image, so there's only one uh, color channel. But for most of our daily life data sets, they do come in with RGB channels 
So in that case, you want to set it for three if you're training something like from real photo, photolistic real data for this case. And the later on, you actually want to have uh, a lot of different output channels to basically represent a lot of variabilities of different convolutional a kernel can give you. So right here, you want to have 32 channels output. And these outputs are generated by 32 different convolutional kernel, which I mentioned a while ago. And we basically have a kernel size equals to three. So the good thing about PyTorch 2D convolutional 2D is that when you specify the kernel size, it like will by default think that you are setting a three by three kernel right here. So which is pretty uh, uh, intuitive, right? And you set up a stride depends on like how you want to move your convolution kernel to the next step. And usually uh, people use padding to make sure some of the dimension are operates uh, as you wish. So these are usually made of zero padding. It's like you put a bunch of zero pixels at the outer edges. And then you can call the activation function and the pooling function right here. Uh, so the hyperparameter is exactly what I said about right here. So this sequential or this self conf one represent for the operation from input image to this first, uh, first convolution and max pooling uh, layers right here. Um, right, so this is how it operates. And the similar thing is that I specify the second things uh, using uh, an undot sequential. And right now, because um, I sort of know like how to put this parameter in place, so I already, I just skip how like the names of them, but PyTorch could directly recognize uh, if you put them in the right sequence. Um, so like you, you can save a bunch of time if you really want to do some experiment with it. And this is uh, basically the convolution too which represents for these two layers, convolution plus ReLU plus max pooling at this stage. And later on, um, I use a, a, a linear uh, function to represent for the fully connected network. And right here, I didn't use exactly the same um, as their additional hidden layer right here. Rather, excuse me. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, so uh, this 64 kernel, uh, like 64 channel means 64 kernels, right? So yes, exactly. each kernel is going to operate on all these 32 individual channels? Um, that's a very good question. So um, these, so so these, um, so the question is like uh, at these uh, 64, uh, these second layers, they, mm -hmm. they, you do see 64 right here. And each convolutional kernel right here actually have the shape of three times three times 32. So they do like gather information from all the previous three feature maps uh, across different channels. Mm -hmm. so, oh, in, uh, so, right. so one kernel is going to look at uh, all the 32 channels, combine exactly. whatever information in this one block exactly. of 64 by oh, sorry 14 by 14 right exactly yes okay uh, other question uh when you initialize the weights mm -hmm. uh what is the range normally you pick to initialize the weights of the kernel or uh, how do you uh, uh, good question um so I think I think it really depends on the case. So I think for 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 uh, MNIST usually um, I think it converts pretty pretty fine with almost what whatever kind of initializations. Um, in some cases, there for more complicated cases like if you're training with like large image data, sometimes people start with some of the pre-trained weights, which they sort of like have. Learn RD from ImageNet data sets, and you can basically start from that initialization and train on whatever data sets you have afterwards. So, so is, really is there a rule of thumb that I shouldn't go beyond one? I should take values between zero and one, or just to avoid any kind of you know overshooting and gradients, or I don't know. Um, 
that part I wasn't so sure. Uh, usually, I I think I experiment with different initialization, and usually whatever works better uh, works better. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I don't know whether there's rule of thumb, but there might be, but I I just don't know. Yeah. And one more thing, uh, once you know, like I apply a kernel on uh, the, a kernel goes to a window and do whatever mm -hmm. it does, the convolution, and then the the the, the convolution, uh, the answer of that convolution passes to a ReLU. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, got it, yeah. thanks. Yep, yeah. yeah. right. Oh, one thing I haven't talked about is that there's also something called, so these convolutional numbers in convolutional kernel are usually called weights. And usually there's something called the bias term, which like it up, basically uh, you give another additional Addition numbers to 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 your output like uh, feature maps, but um, usually I think by default they are said to be true right here. But I haven't specified them right here. Um, yeah. Um, right. These are very good question, and I think the second question is really good. So I'm actually going to see uh, show you how many trainable parameters at these layers, so to give you an idea about why why you have multiple channels could uh, like basically increase the trainable parameters right here. Um, right, so as you can see, like these, when we set up these neural network, we basically set up all the architectures and the init right here. And the next step, what you want to do is to give it a rule of thumbs about how you should feed them properly. And as you can see, like the in PyTorch, you call this thing forward and usually start with X, X usually represent for your input right here, it have the size of 50 and one times 28, 28, and 50 is the batch size. And 28 is just the X and Y axis length of your uh, MNIST data sets. So you want your neural network to start with input and pass it through the first conf one, which we defined right here, um, to the intermediate layers right here. This is what the first uh, line in this forward is doing. And the second line is doing the similar things by bringing information to the other la later layers. And after that, you have a bunch of like uh, thick 2D uh, feature maps. And what you want to do is that you basically want them to be flattened out, which we use the view operation in PyTorch right here to make it a long vector. And we uh, basically operate a linear like, well, linear is not exactly linear, but these are called the fully connected neural network, as you can see the instruction right here showing up. Um, so after these, you have your neural network architectures and these operation, like the, the operation uh, rules to set up. And what you want to do next is to basically uh, call the CNN and bring it onto your GPUs because you, want to do most of the operations on GPU. That's how you can make training faster. And after setting this up, you want to set up an optimizer. Um, so I don't have time to talk about different optimizers, but one of the optimizer I like a lot is called the Atom Atom optimizer. Uh, and, and you can tune a learning rate right here. And it actually operates on all the trainable parameters in your convolutional neural network. And we specify our loss function, which is an dot cross entropy loss, as we uh, discuss what they are. Uh, they are really good for a classification test in general, right here. So right now I'm going to operate this and basically show you how they look like in a summary table. So um, as you can see, like I basically show you the, like this is use something called Toward summary to basically summarize uh, what your CNN looks like in a similar fashion to TensorFlow and or Keras. And like the question you mentioned a while ago, like usually um, in the first convolution, um, because there's only like one input channel, so the trainable parameters, these are trainable parameters at different layers are not that much. But at the other layers, because there are multiple, like your convolutional kernel is actually pretty thick. So there are more convolutional, uh, more uh, trainable parameters right here. 
And also like at fully connected layer, there are just a bunch of the parameters that you're trying to hook up. And so the summation of these parameters are the total trainable parameters for a neural network. And uh, usually in some of the neural network people use to solve real problem, there are more than millions or like more than millions or even greater scale of these parameters. But for the demo purpose, I'm going to just use this really small neural network to, to see how it works. Uh, one more question. Uh, sure. in, a, in an image, there are usually like colored image, three channels, R, G, and B, right? Let's say, if, yes. is it possible I can select maybe two channels and I just want to ignore one of the channels? Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. Um, I think I think what you need to do, um, there are basically different ways to do it. I think if you only want to have information from two channels, you just block out one of the channel and change this to two. Or you can, I don't know, if I'm lazy, I'll just do zero paddings or like uh, repl uh, replace all the information uh, from one color channel and replace it with zeros and keep the same architecture. Um, that's pretty much the same things. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we are going to start training our neural network. So these are usually how you set up a training a process is by uh, specify uh, how many epochs you're going to iterate through and you want to get your X and Y. So usually in machine learning, X is your input data and Y is the label of that input data. And one thing, uh, you use train loader, which is a really good tool in PyTorch. I love it a lot. Um, what you want to do is that when you load this data, uh, you want to make sure that it operates on GPU so that it's operating on the same like convolutional neural network, which we already put it on, CPU, uh, on GPU a while ago. So then you basically have your output from your CNN and you calculate a loss function of your output at any given stage during training with the ground truth label and you sort of get a loss function. And now your test is trying to optimize uh, this loss function. So usually in PyTorch, we use optimizer.zero-grad to initiate things and loss backward to do the bad propagation algorithm which is actually uh, pretty classic, but it's also, you know, we only do it in like just calling one function, which is super, super convenient. And that's pretty much the training process. And one thing we do wrong, want to do is that at, during the training, we do want to test it or validate it, uh, how well it's performing on the testing set, just to make sure that it's operate properly. So we want to check out the prediction and calculate uh, our accuracy and also check out the loss function during the process. So um, after having your network and this training pipeline set up, let's give it a go and see how it works. Oh, well, it's not. Uh, I think I lost connection a while ago. So let me just rerun everything on top and see how it goes. All right, so everything should be processing right now. So as you can see, our neural network start from only 10% of accuracy, which is pretty much like random guess. And after some optimization quickly, go to like 80-ish percent and then just keep optimizing uh, till the end. And as I described to you that this is actually a pretty like simple problem for uh, neural networks. So it only takes uh, 11 seconds for you to train a neural network from knowing nothing about digits to an expert of recognizing digits. And one good thing about training on CPU is that uh, on GPU is that these training time is actually pretty fast. Uh, it, I, I once did an experiment on training things on CPUs and actually might take five minutes to operate the same operation. So five minutes is like 300 seconds, which is like 13 times, 30 times longer than if you operate things on GPU. So I think that's why GPU is a, such a, 
valuable tools in the era of deep learning that you can really speed up the uh, training process. And after having this training, uh, one thing people usually visualize is the history of your loss function, which is already printed out right here. But like, um, I just want to show you like how it actually looks at this stage. So it might take a while because like the other things are operate. Yeah, um, I think it's operating all the things. So let me skip this but jump directly into visualizing the predictions. So um, one thing we try to do when we try to visualize our predictions that you have a trained in your network, you want to see how well it works. You basically want to uh, have your neural network uh, predicting things and see how it works. And right here, I'm just showing some uh, sample about these are neural network prediction for the image below, which it outputs a tensor seven on GPU. And this looks like seven to me, so that's good. And it outputs a two, and this looks like a two to me. It's also looking pretty good. This is one, this is zero. Sometimes it might be confused with six because like, yeah, it's a, it's a Hamilton digit, so it's kind of noisy. And this one is four, so I think they are operating exactly the same, uh, the way I want them to operate right here. So that's actually pretty good. Right, so here we just visualize some of the sample that our neural network has like 98% classification accuracies on this uh, neural network, uh, on this MNIST data sets with PyTorch. And usually, as a scientist, what I would like to see is like, what kind of cases um, do I fail? So right here, I want to visualize a case that they fail to recognize. And for example, right here, the neural network thing, the image below looks like an eight, and which is actually free. But after looking at the image, I could like, Imagine like, or I could think of why this neural network of things, this looks like an A because at some points it, despite these uh, pixels right there, it somehow looks pretty similar to an eight. So in some case, this is not exactly a really bad failure. Like it's not completely getting things wrong, but you see, you see the point that neural network are actually learning something really, really interesting right here. And I personally have no control like how they would operate. So this is a really good and interesting thing to see how neural network actually learns from the data. Right, so we are going back to see the loss function that we didn't plot out a while ago. So right here, what I did is like I plot on the training loss, but usually people plot out training and testing loss at the same time just to see how your neural network is operate. And as you can see, as an optimization problem, usually you start from like a really high loss function and you sort of like want to get this value as low as possible during this optimization as your time move forward. And this is exactly what it's doing. And sometimes it will actually perform slightly worse than the previous step because it's actually doing sort of like a stochastic gradient descent is kind of like searching through a hyper, uh, hyper hyper plan about what could be the best answer or best combination of these uh, trainable parameters to um, build up a classifier. So this is basically what it shows right here. Right, so right now we have a convolutional neural network set up and in PyTorch, so that is pretty uh, pretty good. So now I hope this tutorial basically give you an idea about how to train a, a convolutional neural network using PyTorch, right? So till this, uh, is there any quick question? Hello, can you hear me? So yes, I can I hear. Have a very, very basic question. Uh, yeah. It's related to the um, batch size. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the batch size actually control like uh, 
the the size of a batch that you put into the network, right? Right. But uh, my question is like because we already have the training data, so it that does that means it controls the portion of training data can be seen by the computer each time. Does yes, that exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, um, basically, you have all the training set, but you couldn't feed off them once to the neural network. Otherwise, you couldn't have that much of memory to see all the image at once. Uh, so you basically need to chop things down to a batch size and feed them. Yeah, and yeah, it's exactly so, yeah. like. What you said. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, so, like after chopping into batches, um, the mm -hmm. network were like iterate over these batches and do the learning so all the training data still be seen but they just not seen all at once right exactly exactly okay okay thank you yeah no problem yeah great question thanks for asking so is there any other questions Right, so I'm going to move on to the next demo, like after we have this uh, convolutional neural networks uh, set up. So we're just one of the uh, classic uh, tools for a uh, computer vision task. So you can actually do a lot of things with it. Uh, so basically like classifications or object detections or like, um, I know there's a lot of interesting thing you can you can do with it, and you can actually also visualize their feature maps, which I'm not going to talk about today. But if you're interested uh, about learning what a neural network actually learned on underneath the hood, that's something I think uh, very worth taking into look at. Right. So um, after training a convolutional neural network, um, I think we are pretty. I'm, Personally, pretty satisfied. These are something called the supervised learning, which you have an image, you have a data, and you try to see whether you can come up with a neural network that matches these two really well on your testing sets. But um, to give you a broader context, I think neural network are much more than that. So in one of the particular cases, people are using it to do something called the generative models. So if you are new to uh, generative models, uh, the basic idea is that you can have a neural network that creates new data or new output. Um, so for example, like um, in your mind, like after, so now if I ask you to imagine an image of dog, you could somehow come up with it within your mind. And this dog might look different from any other dogs that you have ever seen, but you can somehow come up with a new image in your mind. And that's exactly what the artificial neural network are doing right here, that you throw a bunch of uh, images to it and actually learn the concept of it and use it to create new data. So this is actually one of my, uh, one of the area that I really like about these neural networks. And based on what the current method of these uh, generative models in deep learning are, they are basically three different type of categories. So one of them are called generative adversarial networks, which in the abbreviation called GAN. And uh, usually they are harder to train and requires more time. So, which is something I'm not going to cover today. But there's other things called variational autoencoder, which I personally like a lot and in, involves with something called encoder and decoder, which I'm going to explain on the next slide. And there's additional things which recently became very popular in the past few years, which is called normalizing flow. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that, but I encourage uh, you to check out online. I thought it's a pretty cool method for generative models. Right, so for the tasks we are going to do today, uh, because we're going to do it in real time. So I thought about maybe we can start generating some uh, Hamilton digits from the MNIST data sets. So the concept is that 
if you have seen a lot of handwritten digits, can you come up with a new handwritten digits that was does not exist in the original data set? And variational autoencoder is exactly the tool to help you do that. So the idea about how it actually works is that there is an encoder structure which is represented by a series of neural network operations. And there's going to be a bottleneck. So in this case, bottleneck is just a vector that represents the information from this image. And usually the bottleneck, as you can tell from its name, has a size that are smaller and sometimes way smaller than the input image. And you have a decoder, basically you want to reconstruct the input image from this information only from bottleneck. So um, there are a lot of like uh, mathematics behind it, but due to the time, I wouldn't talk about detail, but I would like to give you one of the example that I personally thought how to deal with this. So imagine like if you have a pixels that is like made of one or, or made of a circle, for example, like in principle, there are many pixels that contains different values, but because of the symmetry property, you can actually reduce some of the uh, degrees of freedom into some of the bottleneck that you only need like one or two parameters to describe what this image look like. Like you only need the size of the radius or the center of the coordinate, uh, for example. Like you can actually reduce the image into a few parameters and use decoder that learn from how this transformation works. And this is how variational auto decoder operates. Um, so right here, I'm going to show you in code how it operates. So uh, we are going to deal with the same MNIST data because they're, as I said, they're really simple and I can do the training in real time. And right here, I'm building a variational autoencoder using exactly the same like method uh, as I build neural network. I basically define what the encoder neural network and decoder neural network should be. And right here, uh, I use actual different kind of architecture. So right here, I use fully connected architecture for encoder and decoder at the same time. And there are some hidden dimension. They're just like the intermediate layers of your neural network. And um, due to the time, I'm not going to talk about how um, all of them work, but just want to give you an idea about you can uh, actually specify your encoder structure by calling some of the architecture build up right here. And you can actually let it output a min value of your distribution and your log variance of your distribution. So this is something very auto, variational autoencoders are known for. They actually are actually trying to set up some distribution in your bottleneck. And um, you can basically try to sample it to create new data. And you can have a decoder to basically um, take the information from a bottleneck to build the image. And you basically try to pass your input image into encoder and you get some things at the bottleneck. You do some resampling's and you pass the resampling stuff to the decoder and you get the uh, new images from this uh, neural network. So this is how it works. And these are some of the hyperparameters set up right here. And right here, I'm going to use an extreme case, which in my bottleneck, I'm only going to give it two neurons. So imagine that originally you have 28 by 28 pixels, but I'm going to use only two neurons to cover all the possible digits right here, which I thought original thought was pretty crazy, but let's see how it actually works. And this is what our neural network actually looks like. So yeah. And um, right here, we are actually um, using combining different loss function uh, for how we actually want our uh, variational autoencoder to operate. But I'm not going to explain them in detail. But you're basically trying to reconstruct the, your 
you try to pass your reconstruct image to the 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 neural network and see whether it recognizes its uh, original image. That's uh, some of the idea right here. And we are going to load the data again just to see how it works. All right. And right here, we are going to do the same training on our variational autoencoder. We define how we train, and we define how we evaluate. So right here, as you can see, uh, usually in PyTorch, when you try to evaluate things, um, you you basically set them into evaluation mode. So you don't really train things on, on top of that. And um, the other thing I could talk about that's special about these uh, generative models is that you, they, right here, I, don't, I, I think they are not actually using the data provided right here. They're just trying to, yeah, um, not doing it in a supervised way. So this is a difference between convolutional neural network and uh, variational autoencoder. And right here, I'm going. Yeah, question. Oh, oh hello. Uh, I've question of that evaluation mode. So if I don't use that evaluation mode, can't I use that model for testing my model? Um, in principle, yes, but I personally found it quite dangerous because sometimes you might accidentally train things on top of that. Uh, so I think that's more like a, for me, that's more like a good, good practice to basically evaluate things on top of that. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah. That's my personal take. They actually save more computational resources at the same time, I believe. Thanks. And so right here, I'm going to train a variational autoencoder in real time. And I'm not exactly sure what will happen uh, right here. So let's see how it works. And usually, because these are generative models, so it might take a uh, longer time compared with the 11 second convolutional neural network we just trained early. So um, at the same time, if you have any questions, just feel free to let me know while we see a loss function dropping right here. Um. Right, so I'm just going to keep track of the loss function. As you can see, they're dropping uh, at different epochs. And I only set it to train for five epochs. So which is a pretty, usually pretty dangerous thing, but let's see how it works. So right here, I'm going to visualize uh, my, like how my generative model uh, variational autoencoder works. So as I as as I said that usually you in the bottleneck what I did is that I put only two neurons. What it means is that I put two constant or float right there, and you can actually use this to uh, float number to generate new data, and you can tune in whatever you want to generate new data. So right here I just set up a Z right here, and I put it. Um, and from NumPy array into Torch tensor and specify them into float and put them back into CUDA because our variational autoencoder is on, on, on GPU. And just try to see, try to generate simple um, using the decoder and see how they look. So let's see what they look. Okay, so this is a. Uh, New data that I've never, I've never seen before of coming up from this uh, variational autoencoder, and I could then this, as you can see, there's some blurry part of it, and which is like 
maybe because the training wasn't sufficient. But as you can see, this is more like a demo to uh, give you an idea that these can actually generate new uh, images that was not in the training set for sure. And I can actually change some of the number just to give a live demo about what they will look like. So I changed the first value, looks like a slightly different seven. And if I change the value, I don't know what will come up. Oh, now it's uh, getting a nine. So this is actually pretty impressive that you can just by changing two parameters to come up with new handwritten digits. Um, I have a lot of fun with it. Like I usually don't know what they actually learn. So just by poking around and play with it, usually like now we get a two. And as you can see, like there are a lot of interesting things that these uh, variational autoencoder can learn and can generate. So yeah. Um, so one thing I would also like to talk about is that there's actually a lot of information in this bottleneck. So this is actually what people usually call the hidden representation. So um, when people talk about classifying image or processing the information in neural network, it's actually trying to bring all the information from pixel level, which is uh, from what we directly see into the representation space and try to figure out like what are these actually are in representation space. So as, as you can see, like this is uh, one of the case that I'm playing with this representation space and try to see how the neural network actually think uh, where these images or where these handwritten digits are living in this two-dimensional vector space, So which I thought is pretty cool. And also you can do a series of operation just by looping through, like you can imagine like you change some of these uh, uh, hidden representation values in a more uh, smooth way and try to see how they actually change from one to each other. So this is the case that I uh, changed the uh, operate, I loop over the, the value from minus two to two in this like, first neurons in the hidden bottleneck. And as you can see, it actually uh, goes from generating zero. And as you change the number, you start thinking like, oh, maybe six is similar to zero. So they near, leave near more nearby in their uh, representation space. And then you can see you see six is more concrete right here and five lives next to a six and something like that. Then you graduate and move to one, which is a series of different generative images coming from this uh, model. So I hope that this is uh, interesting and um, also like give you an idea about how you can use uh, PyTorch to build this tool. And um, Given time, I think we only have 20-ish minutes left. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the interesting uh, training. I have a question of that the latent dimension, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a hyperparameter, so it's important to pick that proper dimension so that we can believe, express, and extract information successfully. So do you have any advice to pick the proper hidden dimension? Oh, that's that? a tough question. <laughs> um, I don't have a rule of thumb for that, but if your input image, for example, like it's a system that you already know how many parameters should, how many or how many degrees of freedom should be right there. Usually you try to set a representation space to have similar size or order around that uh, degree of freedom. That's what I thought. Um, but sometimes it could also be surprising in learning things in a very different way, which I personally don't know how they operate. So that's a uh, fun part about these neural networks that sometimes there will be surprised that you didn't even realize. Yeah. Uh, so you mean that if we have intuition over that that essential information of input space, we can choose that value as a hidden space, right? 
Yes. Okay, and also, I think you. it also depends on the complexity of the input image. And for for MNIST, it's actually pretty simple. But if you're generating human faces or other things that are more complex, and you might imagine there are more parameters or more, uh, more you need more bigger Latin space for it. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. I have a question my, about. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I have a question about the variation of auto encoder. So, mm -hmm. what are some applications of the VAE? Why we use that? It seems just the encode and decode to itself. All right. I just, <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah. So, um. Basically, there are many uh, motivation for using variation autoencoders. Um, one of them is like, so, um, I mean, one of them is that they are generative models. So um, before game became released really successful these days, these are sort of like uh, one of the top models that you could use to generate new data. And the other things that I personally found really interesting is that you can actually use it as a tool to understand the complexity of the data by just by playing with the hidden representation. Um, so for example, like these are all handwritten digits, but if you play with like human faces, you might find some of the hidden representation describe whether a person in the image is smiling or not and whether they have different hair colors or the, the size of the face or something like that. And to basically learn what would be a good model to dis describe your data. So I, I think that's a, a way I think of how this uh, variational autoencoder could be helpful for understanding the data. Okay. And also I think they are really good at interpolation. Uh, so for example, like if you have discrete data and uh, you want to somehow come up with a generated model to fill the gap. For example, like you're running some simulations and at different time step, you do notice that there's a gap between those time steps, but because of the computational cause, you couldn't really fill a gap or something. I found sometimes this uh, method, uh, this variation of autoencoder could be helpful with some variation yeah, needed. Yeah, I, I have like, like my question is quite similar, but more like um like like extension. So 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 I I know how these like generative models like like where they can be very useful, but mm -hmm. but 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 I think they also have the same problem with like in the traditional machine learning the the unsupervised learning problem is like how do we know the things they generated are the right things, right. Yeah, do, do like 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 in the in in these deep learning um, communities, do they have some something like like rule of thumbs of um, evaluation methods or things like that? Right. So that's a very good question. So how how I think the question could be generalized to like how can you validate your generated image or generated data are uh similar or have the same quality as your original input that you want um i i don't know whether there's a directly rule of form but i think one of the way is that as a human we could directly look at the data and see how how well it is that's that's actually one of the way how people evaluate uh these model and there are other like machine learning method to evaluate it so for example like in gans they use discriminator uh, which is a neural network also just to see whether it thinks the generated image is true or false, uh, is artificial or not. Um, but I think overall, I think this is a, some of the big question in machine learning that I personally don't know like um, how, how people really treat it, but um, I think it's uh, actually pretty open and, and exciting questions or if people want to work on this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm asking this because like I mainly work, work with te text data 
So mm -hmm. when I first see these gen like generators, I think they may be useful to extract the features because they kind of capture some characteristic somehow. But but after a deeper thought, I felt like how should I validate them? And <laughs> yeah, so that's why I asked the question. But thank you, that's very helpful. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for a good question. These are awesome. Well, Joshua, thank you very much for this tutorial. This was really very good. Uh, I think that it was an excellent tutorial to get started using PyTorch. Um, so thank you for all that. So this recording will be posted online, um, so you, you you can watch it and please tell others to find and watch these recordings. Yeah, on our website. Well, so I guess we are done for today. Thank you very much for uh, all attendees for attending it and uh, for Joshua to presenting it. So till next week. Yep. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. And uh, feel free to shoot me an email or follow me on Twitter if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you all. See you around.